Thank you, worship team. Wait a second. Okay. Worship team, I just got to ask you before you leave, did any of you make this mess up here? This looks like a construction. Was it you, Kevin? No, was it? Josiah, what did I tell you about? This looks like your room a little bit right here. I don't know if this is... Mary, do you know anything? You don't know anything? Oh, oh my goodness. This is just a mess. I mean, we were trying to build a manger here, and it is absolutely messy. Oh, good morning, everyone. Good morning. morning. So um, if you're new with us, welcome. I'm Pastor Dave, and uh, this is our house. And uh, we are in a series entitled How to Build a Manger, and uh, apparently we're not very good at that just yet. And so, Kevin, you sure? It wasn't you. Okay. All right. Check with your wife. See if she remembers. All right. No, I'm pretty sure that I know who's responsible for this, and I have to apologize again. If you were with us last week, you realize we're talking about how to build a manger, and in the meantime, we don't seem to have a manger here inside of our stable just yet. We have plenty of tools and way too much. There is no way we need all this, but we're talking about really how to put Jesus in the center of our busy lives. So maybe this is a great picture, and I'm just realizing that we have a little ish. Aha. Well, I see what one of the problems is. Aha. Uh-huh. So these, anybody remember what we talked about last week? Blueprints, plans, right? Yeah, so we've got plans here. And uh, the problem is that the person who's responsible for this has clearly not even looked at the blueprints yet. And so, obviously, we talked about last week, if you're going to put Jesus in the center, you've got to follow his plan. Amen? You all remember that? Yeah, so this is the plans, and I tell you what, we're just going to get, whoa, oh. I'm okay. Oh, oh no. No, don't, oh. don't get up, don't oh. rush, it's okay, don't rush the stage, I'm okay. Oh. All right, um, oh, I can't okay, go up. I can't go up. No. well, oh, look how convenient, a megaphone, because <laughs> I know exactly who's responsible for this, Maggie, uh-oh. Uh oh, I think I broke the check. Check. Can you hear me now? Maggie! Maggie! Okay, 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 okay. Yes, yes, yes. I'm Maggie? so sorry. This is my stuff. I'm, I'll get it cleaned up right away. Okay, I'm getting Maggie. it. I'm getting it. I'm, get, Maggie. I'm, I'm getting it. I'm doing Maggie. it. Okay, okay, I got it. I got it. I'll, I'll get it out of the way. Maggie. What? Maybe you could start by helping me up. Oh, yes, yes, of course. Right. Oh, I'm so sorry. I forgot about you. Yes, yeah. I did this stuff. Okay, here we go. All okay, right. all right. Okay. Oh, oh. Yeah. Okay. yeah, well. Right. Okay. Oh, watch your head. Thank you. All right. Yep. All right. Okay. Woo. Okay. I'm going to guess this is your stuff. Well, um, yes. It, no, no, no. Well, it's our stuff, you know, for the manger, that thing you asked me to build. This is our stuff. Okay, Maggie, look. I'm, oh, wow. Okay. Woo. That doesn't feel great. Um, these are plans, and you were supposed to build a manger. Right, okay, um, yeah, well, they deliver the stuff, so it's here, and yeah. I'm so sorry it's a All mess. Right. I, I, I forgot that it was Sunday, and, you know, they just... It's okay, it's okay. I tell okay. you what, you clean this up a little bit so yes. we can have oh, a service. Abs- I'll be right back because okay. I think I need a Band-Aid uh, okay, or absolutely. a cast or just a mommy's kiss. I'm not sure, so... Okay. Um, She's out here somewhere, so, okay. Okay, actually, though, while, while you're here, can I just, just grab you for a minute, please, please? Yeah. Okay, um, this... Do I really have to do it? I mean, why me? I mean, you have so many people to choose from. Why do I need to do this? Well, I do have a lot of people that could possibly do this, but Maggie, I know you can do it, and I chose you. Okay. So just take care of it. Okay. Okay? Yeah. And I'm going to go. Okay. Well, uh, are you sure? I mean, I I don't have to do that. Here. Blueprints. Follow them. And by the way, your name's on those. Oh. I chose you. Okay. Okay, bye. Okay. And make it quick, because i got to preach a sermon. Yeah, yeah, right, absolutely, okay. absolutely. Yeah, All right. Yeah. Be right back. Okay. Thanks. Yep. Good, good talk. Yep. Thanks for the boost of confidence. Okay. Oh. Okay, no, no. Now, why in the world did he choose me? Me, of all people, did he not read my resume? Nowhere on it did it say anything about past work experience or, or doing something with wood and, and, and tools. I mean, I don't know a nail from a hammer, unless that's when my nail's on my hand. 
no, but why did he choose me? I mean, he has so many people to choose to do this project. Like, don't we have a maintenance person out here? There's got, I know there's a maintenance guy. I'm sure he could put this thing together in about three minutes. And it would come included with a deer hide, I'm sure. <laughs> or even better, oh, a youth pastor. Don't we have a youth pastor here? I mean, they're great for doing these random jobs around the church. We can find the youth pastor to do this. Why me? I can't do this. No, I've never done this before. I don't have any work experience. And then what if I actually do it? And then it looks terrible. My name would be all over it. My reputation. They would never ask me to do anything around here. No, oh, no, no. I cannot do this. He said something about the plans, though. No, I, well, no, no. does have my name on it to do it. Well, perhaps I could, I don't know, this looks like something fun. Um, or, no, that's a little too sharp. Okay, no, this thing is another, like this pile of mess. What am I supposed to do with this? It just, it looks like a big pile of junk when I ordered this material according to the plans. I thought it would come in a nice little box and I just, poof, there's a manger. I didn't think I would have to put it together. Okay, Maggie, no, you can do this. You are a professional. They want you to do it. You can do it. Baby steps. Baby steps. One foot in front of the other. Baby steps to do this project. Baby steps I can do. Okay, no, I can't do this but I could take baby steps, not to the project, but into some new footwear. That's what I'll do. I'll first start with new footwear. I can take steps to the project with new footwear. Here I go, Maggie, you can get it. Here we go. All right, thank the Lord for Maggie this morning. I'm healed. Praise the Lord. Well, praise God. Thank you, Maggie, that is uh, wonderful. And uh, we'll get back to her later. But for now, let's get out our Bibles and let's talk about what it means <clears throat> to put Jesus in the center of our lives. How many of you know God has a plan for your life? Raise those hands up in the air this morning. And that plan involves things that God wants to do for you, but guess what? That plan has a big part of what God wants to do through you. And that's what I want to talk about today, how to build a manger. We talked about last week that Building a manger and in real life involves following blueprints, as Maggie has really struggled to do that, and yet and still, the reality is that you and I have a plan laid out for us by the Lord. And we talked about this last week, and many of you raised your hand that not only did you believe that every person had a unique plan, but that you, that God had a unique plan for you, and that then we asked that difficult and challenging question, am I living out the plan that God has for me. And I pray for you this Christmas season and for me that we would come to grips with the fact that Jesus will never be the center of our life unless we are following the plan that God has laid out for us. And then today, we're talking about raw materials. And I want to just say this to you about building a manger. Building a manger means building our life in such a way that Jesus is alive in us, at the center of every desire and every decision. That's what it means to build a manger here, a, a place where Christ is at the center of your life. And maybe you heard it in the old days, they would talk about the throne of your life and who is sitting on the throne of your life. Is it Jesus or is it you? And here we're looking at a manger being built in our lives where Jesus can live in the center of our life. I want you to continue to ask yourself this question. Is, true, is Jesus truly in the center of my life? And uh, today we're going to talk about raw materials, raw materials. So what you see behind you on the stage are raw materials, just a collection of wood and, and, and tools, and I don't even know what some of this stuff that she's laid out here, a box with a caution sign on it. I didn't even want to look in there. 
But the reality is that in life, life can seem a little messy that way, and it's hard to figure out what God's wanting to do. And today we're going to talk about the raw materials of building a manger. Building a manger starts with understanding what raw materials are needed. So clearly Maggie here once again is struggling with how to build a manger. She's got a lot of stuff here, and clearly much of it is not needed for a manger. It's actually more simple than she's made it out to be. And isn't that just like life? But I want to let you know something about the plan of God that is, I think, essential for us to come to grips with today, and that is this. Building a life centered around Jesus starts with understanding that you and I are the raw materials that God chooses to use. Do you believe God can use ordinary natural humans to do extraordinary supernatural things? If you do, raise your hand up in the air. Do you believe it? Then if that's yes, do you believe that God can use you to do extraordinary supernatural things? Raise your hand if you believe that this morning. Well, good. Now I wonder, do you live like it's true? Do you believe that God wants to work in and through you to advance his kingdom on the earth? And if so, then you're the raw materials and so am I. Some great scriptures about this that I want you to think about today. 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 3 and 4 says, His divine power has given us everything. Everybody say everything. everything. I love it when the scripture, you'll find, you'll find I have a little habit. Whenever I come to very strong language in the scripture, like all or everything, I'll probably have you repeat it. And that's because it doesn't say some or a little bit or almost. The key is when the Bible says everything, it means everything. I used to have a professor in college back at Liberty who would say, you know, he would set it up in this wonderful way about studying the Greek and the Hebrew. And he'd say, and when the scripture says all, I studied it and all means all. And I was just like, this is great, you know, and this just became famous, all means all. There is no other way to nuance it so as to not be responsible for the information that is being said here. So his divine power has given us everything we need for a godly life. Through our knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and goodness, through these... He has given us his very great and precious promises that so through them you may participate in the divine nature. That's incredible language right there. Having escaped the corruption in the world caused by evil desires. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 7. In case you wonder if you are the raw materials that God is choosing to use and why would he choose me as Maggie was wrestling with this morning. Why me? I don't understand. Have you ever felt that way about the call of God in your life? I know this morning, I was talking to Brenda this morning, and she was coming right, and she's like, I'm not sure if I can do this. Like, why me? And yet, that's the point. It is, all of us could say that. You say, well, you're a pastor, and you, you know, you got it all figured out. Trust me, I don't. And every day that I honestly, and I, you, you get better at things the longer that you do them, but I understand that without the presence of God in my life, without Him, why me? Like, what? it would make no difference. I wouldn't be able to do What I do in the Lord, unless it were for his supernatural power working inside of us. Getting into where God has called us to be and following that is the key. But here we see in 2 Corinthians 4, 7, we have this treasure, this glory of God, in jars of clay to show that this all-surpassing power is from God and not from us. So actually, the weaknesses that we have, jars of clay at the time, although we like them for decoration now, they were like the cardboard boxes of their time. And so this was like saying that God loves to display his glory through ordinary cardboard boxes so that no one will get it confused. It's not about me. It's about Christ in me. Acts chapter 1, verse 8 But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. So the Holy Spirit comes into us that we might be witnesses. You mean God is getting the most important message that has ever been told. He's getting it to people primarily through you and I. We are witnesses. 
There were those who witnessed it firsthand with their eyes. They shared it to other witnesses. And then, of course, just the Spirit of God coming into our life. We witness and we see and we hear and we experience things in the Lord, and we are to bear witness of that. That's exactly how God wants to bring His kingdom to the earth. How about 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 20? If you're not convinced that you are the raw materials, we are therefore Christ's ambassadors. As though God were making his appeal through us, we implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. God has chosen you and I to be ambassadors. Not some of us, but all of us. Those who have called upon the name of Jesus are now recruited in to being a part of his kingdom work. Let me give you a few more. Matthew chapter 5, verse 14. You are the light of the world. Now, by the way, this is not saying Jesus is the light of the world. He is the light of the world. But here it takes it one step further. In other words, Jesus is the light of the world, and Jesus in you becomes light to the world. So you are the light of the world. And a town built on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on a stand, and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. Isn't that incredible? Now, I know if you've been in the church for over any, any length of time, this, this might just ring through as things you've heard before, but would you allow yourself with me today to, to let that truth settle into your hearts? You are ambassadors. You are the light of Christ. You are witnesses. You are filled with the Spirit that you may bear witness. You are God's plan to the earth of how He is conveying Himself. You are the raw materials. I am the raw material, and God wants to shine through these jars of clay to make His glory known to the earth around Him. If you're bemoaning the fact, as I do, that Christ has been pulled out of Christmas in our culture, understand something. God is not up in heaven wringing his hand, wondering why people aren't talking more about Christ on commercials. What he's probably wringing his hands about is that the church is not realizing that Christ is in them and that they're not letting the light shine in the midst of the holiday season and making sure Christ is clear. I don't think he's signing a petition to eliminate secular commercials. He's making a plea to you and I that we live Christ out in our culture. That's how he's reaching this world around. If you agree, say amen. amen. Ephesians chapter 5, or, uh, excuse me, Ephesians chapter 3, verse 7. We, we preached on this entire series through Ephesians, and maybe this got lost in the shuffle for you, but Paul understood this. He understood, and, and Paul, yes, was unique in his specific calling, but he's not unique in the fact that we all have a calling from God. And, 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 and Paul was amazed. Wow, God wants to use me, and Paul understood his weakness he called himself the, the least among the apostles and the worst of all sinners. And he said, I've come from a place where I was, I was just, I'm in this awful place and, and I'm not acceptable until Jesus comes into my life. And then suddenly Paul realized that God had a plan for him and that he could be a part of that and God wanted to use him. And in verse 7 of chapter 3, he says, I became a servant of this gospel by the gift of God's grace given me through the working of his power. Aren't you thankful for God's grace today? Because if I'm the raw material and you're the raw material, we're going to need a lot of grace. A lot of grace. Verse 8, although I'm less than the least of all the Lord's people, this grace was given me to preach to the Gentiles the boundless riches of Christ and to make plain to everyone the administration of this mystery, which for ages past was kept hidden in God who created all things. Listen to verse 10. Because this is one of the few, I love this verse because it expresses God's intent for the season you and I live in right now. His intent was that now, through the church, everybody say through the church. Through the church. And does that mean church on Sunday morning? Who's the church? We are. We are. The church meets together and then the church goes out and does God's will, taking the light of Christ with us. We are the church. It doesn't mean that he wanted to minister just through Sunday mornings. He wants to minister through his body, his church, which is the people. 
The manifold wisdom of God should be made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly realms according to his eternal purpose that he accomplished in Christ Jesus our Lord. Eternal purpose. This was always his plan. From the beginning of our own time and even before, he had this plan to be accomplished through Christ Jesus. Verse 12, in him and through faith in him, we may approach God with freedom and with confidence. So we are the raw materials. Let's go today to the book of Luke, chapter 1. And as we ease in, or maybe now we're in full sprint mode into Christmas, it is upon us and we're rolling into the season with great fervor and I hope excitement in your heart. I want to look at two stories, really, that are interweaved together in the Scripture, so we'll share them together in in, in an incredible way, I think, today story of two incredible people who must have, and we can see from the Scripture, felt that they were insufficient for the task. As a matter of fact, the whole entire Christmas narrative is a story of really ordinary and sometimes very flawed, always very flawed people who God showed up and told them He was going to use them for this most miraculous plan. And if you watch their reactions and ones that you've read before and thought about, but maybe the Holy Spirit, Lord, today, give us a fresh revelation of what this means for me. I know a lot of Christians who feel their own weaknesses and frailty, and they forget along the way that God wants to do incredible things through them, not only in them. Luke chapter 1, verse 5, what obstacles keep us from the will of God and from fulfilling the plan of God in our lifetime? I think that's a question I want you to ponder. I hope you will ponder it with me today. To consider maybe even this past year and and your response to the Lord and where you're serving Him and where you're afraid to serve Him or if you maybe have just been serving Him kind of because you're you're working in the church or you've been just doing things for people and maybe you've just kind of gotten into the routine and you've forgotten that God has a plan for your life and you are the raw materials that He wants to build so that Jesus becomes the center of your life and everywhere you go. Jesus is conveyed to others. What are the obstacles? Let's start in Luke chapter 1, verse 5, as we read this familiar passage together. And we're going to encounter two people today, Zechariah and Mary. Most of you will know that Zechariah is the father of John the Baptist, who would prepare the way for Jesus. And you know the interaction between Elizabeth and Zechariah and Mary and Joseph. But today, let's look at it with eyes to see What is it that could potentially keep us from being used by God? Luke chapter 1, verse 5. In the time of Herod, king of Judea, there was a priest named Zechariah who belonged to the priestly division of Abijah. His wife Elizabeth was also a descendant of Aaron. Both of them were righteous in the sight of God, observing all the Lord's commands and decrees blamelessly, but they were childless because Elizabeth was not able to conceive, and they were both very old. Let me start with one of the first obstacles, and I think I see them over here in the stack of obstacles that Maggie has blessed us with today. This is one of the first obstacles that I see in trying to live out the plan of God in your life and realizing and remembering that you are the raw materials that God wants to use, and that is the disappointments of life. Anybody who's lived a little bit in the Lord or or been around life for a while realize that there are hopes and dreams that we have, and then we come to a reality in our life as we get older and as we come through important decisions in life that some of those dreams have not been fulfilled in the way that they thought, and some just completely like they're dead and gone, and our hopes and our dreams, and this is one of the most devastating things that can happen to a person is that they lose all hope. They become disappointed. We see Elizabeth and Zechariah here who are godly and righteous people. They've been following the Lord, and yet one of Elizabeth's deepest desires, and probably Zechariah as well, is to have a child. And in that culture especially, if you didn't have a child, it was, it was seen as this um, just this curse that was upon you that you were unable to bear 
children. And it was seen in the culture particularly in a way that would have been very insulting or very less than. And so they felt this shame and they felt this desire to pass on their family name, but they had had no children. They were unable to conceive. And now they were very old, past the age that you can give birth. And I wonder how Zachariah is. He is still serving the Lord faithfully. You've got to uh, appreciate the fact that he's still pressing in and serving as a priest. And he goes into the temple here. But he is a priest who is disappointed about the fact that of all the things that he may have seen God do, God couldn't do this thing for them to bless them in their life. Can I suggest to you today that there are disappointments in our life that we have not yet get gotten over sometimes, and they can, be, they can start to shake our faith and shake our desires, and we think, well, if that doesn't come true, then what about all the rest? And, and if God really says he wants to use me, but he couldn't do this thing in my life, we will sometimes be paralyzed in our life because we've lost hope, and we've lost those dreams, and it feels like it's too late and too far, and we're too far gone. Disappointments can be an obstacle in our life that keeps us from realizing that God still has an incredible plan before us and for us. Let's go to verse 8. Now, once when Zechariah's division was on duty and he was serving a priest before God, as a priest before God, he was chosen by lot according to the custom of the priesthood to go into the temple of the Lord and burn incense. And when the time for the burning of incense came, all the assembled worshipers were praying outside. And then an angel of the Lord appeared to him standing at the right side of the altar of incense. When Zechariah saw it, he was startled and he was gripped with fear. But the angel said to him, do not be afraid, Zechariah. Your prayer has been heard. Your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son and you are to call him John. Incredible moment here. You know, it's interesting to me that every time an angel showed up, that was the first words out of their mouth, don't be afraid. Must be an incredibly uh, majestic uh, warrior. This would have been Gabriel standing at the side of Zechariah, and he is petrified, and he is frozen, and he's receiving news that sounds too good to be true, but he's frozen and paralyzed, which is the second obstacle I often see in my life and in other believers' life, and that is the obstacle of fear. The obstacle of fear. How many times have we just been frozen by what we think God is calling us to do or what we've thought about doing for God and we're just too afraid? Sometimes it's because it's such a great, great vision and we're afraid to to make mistakes or we're afraid that we're going to mess up. How many times have you been paralyzed to not step forward because you thought, well, what if it's just me and it's not God? Fear is one of the greatest paralyzers in our life. And I believe it's one of the things that's keeping a lot of believers. What will they say? What will people think of me? Will they think I'm crazy if I do this thing? Will they, will they, I, mean, I, I mean, I just can't imagine what Zechariah begins to process as the angel begins to unpack for him what he's telling him. It seems too good to be true, and nobody at that age can have children. And yet God is delivering a message, and fear could have kept Zechariah from the promises of the Lord. Go to verse 18. Zechariah asked the angel, how can I be sure of this? I am an old man and my wife is well along in years. Oh, I think this is going to speak to some of you today because one of the third obstacles for many of us is a big one for a lot of people. Do you think? How on earth could God use me? I'm too old. I'm too far gone. I'm too this. I'm too that. I'm too young. I'm too inexperienced. I'm too weird. God can't use me. I'm too unpolished. Don't you know I stumble over my words, Lord? I'm too afraid. I've made too many mistakes. I think this is a big one that stumbles a lot of people. I think it causes us to think about the fact that we don't think we're up to the job. And then we look at others, 
And we see them in what appears to be this polished format and everything goes perfectly for them. Forgive us, Lord, for not trusting that you can work through us and do mighty things through us. I think there's another one hidden in here as well, and for Zechariah, the insecurities could have led to the next one, which is also pretty common for a lot of people. Excuses. Have you let your insecurities become excuses? Because it can happen. Lord, I'm too busy. Lord, I, I, I have a family i got to take care of. Obviously, I need to do that. And Lord, I can't get involved in that thing that you've laid on my heart to do. Lord, I, I, surely somebody else can do it. You know, in our skit this morning, you know, Maggie comes in and just says, I mean, there's got to be people here that could do this better. You know, if you live your life comparing to others, you'll never do anything of significance. If I was worried about being the best pastor that had ever been and better than all the other preachers, I would be paralyzed. I would never preach. Because there will always be someone better. I remember telling my kids when they were coming up through sports, and I would tell them, I would say, you just can't compare yourself to others. You can always strive to do better within who you are. You can look at people who are better and learn from them, but don't ever compare yourself. There's nobody who is the best at what they do. And if they are the best at what they do, likely they would say, well, there would be a debate between people as whether they're best or somebody else is the best. And in the end, there could only be one, and that would probably be disputed. There's never a best at anything that you're going to do. And even if you look around and say, well, my goodness, there's 20 people who could do it better, it doesn't matter if God calls us to do it, we've got to do it. I'm not trying to be up here and be the best preacher you've ever heard, and you all say, amen, that's true, Pastor, you're not. (laughs) It's okay. I don't need to do that. All I need to do is wake up and say, Lord, use me in a way that is needed for what you've called me to and where you put me. Give me the ability to minister in the way I can and help me to grow and help me to get better at it. But Lord Jesus, I'm doing this for you. You've called me to do it, and I'm doing it for you. I remember when people would come to me over the years, and one of the biggest insecurities and fears and excuses that I've heard in people, and I'm probably going to step on some toes right now, so pull your toes in a little bit, but here it comes. People don't like to pray in public. They say, I don't pray in public, Pastor. And I have to say, in a, in a, in a kind of funny way, if you're concerned about that, I want to encourage you today. I remember telling one person, I they, they kept saying that to me, They're like, I don't know, you know, what if I say something good? I'm, I'm bound to say something goofy, right? And I'm, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to really mess it up. And I said, listen, if you ever get done praying in public and someone afterwards says you did a bad job or that they didn't like the way you prayed or it was too this or too that, it was too short or too long or that was weird, why would you use words? You just look them square in the eye and say, well, I wasn't talking to you anyway. <laughs> so right? I'm talking to the Lord, and I'm doing something He's called me to do, and I'm just going to pray to Him. Man, that will alleviate your fears if you don't compare yourself to others and don't use excuses of your own insufficiencies to actually stop doing the very thing that God has called you to do. Let's go to verse 19, because I appreciate... Zachariah here, he gets a bit challenged in his reaction, interestingly, and when he says, how can this be? Clearly, we see that this was coming from a place for Zachariah where he was not realizing that God could use him and was saying, you can't, this isn't, can't happen. You don't know who you're talking to. It doesn't work for us. Verse 19, the angel said, because he asked, he says, how can I be sure of this? And the angel says this, and let the Lord speak this to you, because I love these words of Gabriel. He says, I am Gabriel. I stand in the presence of God, and I have been sent to speak to you and to tell you this good news. Think about the response to the excuses. (laughs) Zacharias says, I, I mean, I, like, how can you say this? And Gabriel's like, are you serious? 
paraphrase. Are you serious right now? Do you know that I am Gabriel and I literally stand in the presence of God and he said to me with his own mouth, go tell Zechariah that this is what's going to happen and you're doubting it? Hello? Can I tell you something today? The word of God has been written to us and it has said that God loves us and has a plan for our life and that he would send his Holy Spirit, which, by the way, happened a few years ago. The Holy Spirit is on the earth. The Holy Spirit is in us who have believed in him. And God says he wants to make known to the entire spiritual world and the physical world the, the plan of salvation and his gospel and that his plan is that now, through the church, He's going to accomplish this. You have been called to go and to tell people about Jesus. You have been called to go and be a part of his plan on the earth. The presence of God, the angels standing there, all of it being done to deliver this message to you and I. You are the people that God wants to use. And God Almighty has delivered a message to us that we are to be used by Him. And then he says in verse 20, and now you will be silent and not able to speak until the day this happens. I'll tell you what, Zechariah, it's an interesting study. Can't go into it right now. What's going on here? But he says, because you did not believe my words, which will come true at their appointed time. When God speaks into our life, when God speaks through his word and delivers these messages, you can take it to the bank. It's true. And that's one of the other obstacles that has come into many of our lives, and that is unbelief. Unbelief. Do you believe that God can use you? Do you have faith to believe? Where is your faith? Is it in God, or is your faith more in your own abilities and lack thereof. Because if you don't think that you're good enough to do it, that's fine. Because on your own, we're not. But if you don't think that God can do it, that's a problem. You say, well, no, you don't understand. The obstacles that God would have to overcome in me are too great. No, no, that's a lack of faith that God can work through anyone. Can I get an amen? Amen. Uh, I mean... I'm not good with my words. I'm not, I'm not bold. I'm not like this person with that or that person. Do you believe God is able to do exceedingly abundantly more than you ask or think in your life and through your life? I love the fact David in the Old Testament facing a giant named Goliath. It was like logical to him. He goes, I don't get it. Why are you guys trembling in fear? Why are you worried? He, because the entire Israelite army at that time were insecure, living in fear, and they had a lack of a belief, un, they had unbelief towards God because they weren't sure that this giant could be defeated. And David steps up and he had great faith in a God who he even learned to trust because God had been faithful in the past. He said, I don't get it. Why are you guys fearing? It, with, this man is insulting God. He's standing up and defying the, Lord, the God of the Lord's armies and um, God will destroy him, so I'll go. Why not? I can't miss if God is in the middle of it. I wonder for you and I if we could have that same level of faith. Let's go to verse 26. And now the story intertangles with Mary, and we'll just spend just a moment in it. Just one more obstacle, because really Mary faced many of the same. You can see it. She, she wrestles through this. In the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy, verse 26... God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, a town in Galilee, to a virgin pledged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of David. The virgin's name was Mary. The angel went to her and said, Greetings, you who are highly favored. The Lord is with you. Listen to the similar language. Why is that assuring the Lord is with you? Well, that kind of startles Mary because she's being said she's highly favored. She's being approached by an angel. In verse 29, she says, it says, Mary was greatly troubled at his words and wondered what kind of greeting this might be. But the angel said to her, do not be afraid. Mary, you have found favor with God. 
you will conceive and give birth to a son, and you are to call him Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over Jacob's descendants forever. His kingdom will never end. And then Mary, it seems, asks a very similar question, but we realize from the response of the angel, it's a, it's, a, it's a different type of question, but she says, how will this be? Mary asked the angel, since I am a virgin. I think what was going on in Mary was less about some of these other things, but maybe just the one that, that stumbles us the most, which is just uncertainty. I don't understand, God, how you can use me. I don't understand, God. Is this the way you're calling me to go? This doesn't seem to make sense. I seem to have limitations. And so maybe some of us are sure that God wants to use us, and maybe he's used us in some areas, but we're still uncertain as to whether he can use us in every area. And sometimes we're just not sure what the plan is. And I see Mary here. She said, I don't, I don't understand how... How can this happen? And I love the fact that when we have uncertainties, we can bring them to God, and God's not going to just cast us away, but instead help to answer our question and make sure that we understand. And let me give you this as we begin to close today. How do we overcome these obstacles and make ourselves available to be used by God and to have Jesus be the center of our lives? How do we overcome these obstacles that can seem so bad? Maybe you've struggled with a few today. Maybe some of them you think, you know, I'm doing okay there in my own life, but some of these are tripping me up. Some of them are causing me to slow down in my walk with the Lord. Look what happens in Luke chapter 1, verse 35. You're going to see all of these different aspects, and then I'll give you five things to look at that I believe helps anyone to put Jesus in the center, to, to be the raw materials that God will use to trust Him and to step out and to be a part of His plan on the earth. This is how we overcome these obstacles. obstacles. Luke 1, verse 35. The angel answered, the Holy Spirit will come on you. And the power of the Most High will, What? overshadow you. So the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. In other words, Jesus would be called first and foremost the Son of God before He would be called the Son of Mary and of Joseph. In other words, God was going to do the heavy lifting here if Mary would be willing. Verse 36, even Elizabeth, your relative, is going to have a child in her old age, and she who was said to be unable to conceive is in her sixth month. Verse 37, you should probably underline this one, for no word from God will ever fail. Can we say that three times together today? Ready? Right together from this version right here, verse 37. Ready? For no word from God will ever fail. Let's try it again with a little more conviction. For no word from God will ever fail. Now say it to yourself. For no word from God will ever fail. Some of you did it quietly. I just meant say it, speak it to yourself. Like, I'm going to say it in my heart now. I'm not even going to say it out loud. Let's do it one more time with great conviction. For no word from God will ever fail. If it is from God, it will not fail. And Mary was able to, in this moment of, of can't believe that God is going to use me and how is he going to do this, he made these points. And I want to give you five things just in closing today. Number one, how do we overcome these obstacles? Receive Jesus into your heart by faith. I know most of you have done that in your life already today, but listen, there is no other way to be used of God in your life. You can do good works and do good things, but until you've received Jesus by faith, saying, Jesus, I will no longer live for my own. I repent of my sins. Come into my life. I want to be saved. It's the only way to eternity, eternal life with Jesus, and it's the only way to be a part of his kingdom work. Jesus, come into my life. I repent of my own selfish living and want to live for you. Number two, understand your value in Christ. I don't know if this has come through just yet today, but as I look out across this room today, and if anybody's even listening to us or watching online, I want you to hear this today because it is the truth of God's Word. You are so valuable to God. 
He loves you with an everlasting love. He knows you inside and out. Whether you've received him yet or not, he knows you. He puts you together, we woven perfectly together in your mother's womb, and you have value and you have purpose. And no matter how much we screw it up, and no matter how many things have happened to us, and no matter what has come in our life, God still loves you, and he sees you as someone that he wants to pour his love fully into that you might receive it. He wants to re- restore all all that has been broken. He wants to bring you back to full fellowship with him. That includes that peace that we talked about today, true peace on your innermost parts where you know that God is in control. He has that in mind for you. He has in mind for every person on the face of the earth, and you are no different, and God wants to restore you and fill you up and strengthen you, and then he wants to send you out with his love and his patience and his kindness into a world that desperately needs it. God has has a unique plan for your life. It's different than the people around you. It's unique to you, and he loves you and sees you and wants to use you for his kingdom. God loves us. God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son. Number three, surrender every fear, insecurity, and doubt to the Lord. You've got to just surrender it today. Take all of these excuses and reasons and obstacles and carry them before the Lord today and say, Lord, these are the things that have been slowing me down and tripping me up and whatever it is for you today. Maybe there's some I didn't even mention today. I said, Pastor, you missed a couple that I've got, some real things that have been obstacles in my life. Can I tell you that you can take every one of these and you can lay them down at his feet at the foot of the cross and surrender them to the Lord and you can walk out of this place today saying, Lord, I surrender all of those things to you and I want Jesus to be the center of my life. I realize and I understand I am the raw material that you are building a manger that your presence may dwell in me so that I might be able to walk in your power. We see number four, walk in the power of the Holy Spirit. You don't have to be afraid of those terms. There's been many who, who get very fearful about talking about the Holy Spirit and, and, and get fearful of kind of losing that control or being open to the Spirit of God. But it's so clear in the Word of God that for every believer, the Holy Spirit is available not just as an extra thing or to make us do weird things. It is actually available there that we might even accomplish any of what we've talked about today and so much more. The Holy Spirit stirring in our hearts, us being open to hear Him and listen to Him and follow Him. to to even be able to know the plan and be able to follow the plan and do things that are beyond our ability to comprehend. And ever someone can look at our lives and say, "You, you said something and it ministered to me. You did something for me at the right time and it was just what I needed. And you can look at it and say, I know the Spirit of God has been my helper and my counselor and the Spirit's power inside of me is helping me to accomplish something for the King of God that I never could have accomplished on my own. What an incredible thing to experience. Walk in the power of the Holy Spirit and believe God at His Word. God said it. It's, I'm not telling you this, something that God didn't say. It's not just my idea. Uh, you know, maybe if it were up to the humans, we would say, well, some people can be used more than others. But no, God seems to speak very clearly. He has a very specific call for each and every one of us. And the more weak we are, the more his glory can shine through us in powerful ways. We can be used by God as his raw materials. Would you stand to your feet, worship team? Would you come up this morning? What an incredible truth today. I want to pray, and then the worship team will take us out with a song this morning. I want to personally invite you, please come back this evening and be with us at the movie night. It's just going to be a really fun night. We're just going to watch a movie that is very special. I have to say, you know, selfishly, it's one that my family is just, my, we've watched it every year now for the last few years around Christmas time, and it's a joy for me to do that with you, and I hope you'll be able to make time to come and be a part of seeing the movie, It's a Wonderful Life, and if you've never watched it from beginning to end, you might be surprised with a group of people, it's a whole different experience, it's not just one of those background Christmas movies, it's just a wonderful time, it's going to be popcorn and cookies and fun, and uh, we just encourage, I hope you'll come out and just join us, uh, we'll turn this into a giant living room. And uh, it'd be pretty awesome. And so let me pray for us today as we 
ask God to continue to move in our lives. Lord, we thank you and we praise you. Lord, thank you that we get to be a part of your plan on the earth. Thank you we can make choices in our life to build a manger, a place for Jesus to reside very deeply inside of us, that his light might shine through us in the days ahead. We thank you and we praise you, Lord. And whatever we've been convicted of today, Lord, may we bring and surrender to you. And may we step out in faith to do the works you've called us to do, that Jesus might spread around this world through this Christmas season. In Jesus' name, amen.